This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Hello and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii, and it never got quiet. This is a half hour program that explores the Hawaiian connection with the Vietnam War. I'm your host, Vic Kraft. Our guest today is Jean Timonok. Hope I got that right. Jean is a graduate of Mary Knoll High School in Honolulu and the University of San Francisco. He began his military career in the U.S. Army Reserve Officer Training Corps. He was commissioned in 1963. Jean served two tours in Vietnam, 1965 through 66, and again in 1968, departing in 1969. He was awarded the Bronze Star Medal and the Army Commendation Medal. Jean began a long and productive career with St. Francis Healthcare System, serving in several capacities, beginning as their first director of development with the organization and retiring in 2007, holding the positions of president and chief executive officer for St. Francis Healthcare Foundation and St. Francis Residential Care Community and Chief Foundation Officer, St. Francis Healthcare System of Hawaii. In 1984, Jean took a leave of absence from St. Francis to become Managing Director of the County of Hawaii. He returned to St. Francis Medical Center in 1987. In 1993, he was appointed trustee for the King Lunalilo Trust Estate by the Hawaii Supreme Court. Jean has written a book titled Almost a Hero, and he is with us here today to talk about his experience in Vietnam and his book. Aloha and welcome, Gene. How you doing? Fine, thank you. First of all, before we get into your book, uh, you had a number of uh, tasks inside the Army. Could you explain exactly what happened to you and part of your career? And I know it's going to be in your book, but uh, really like to hear about it. Yeah. But it I've had an interesting career uh, in the Army, beginning with ROTC. And uh, upon graduation, I was uh, commissioned uh, immediately. So I was uh, equal to someone from West Point, which meant I, was, I had my first job immediately. Mm -hmm. And uh, my first assignment was at Fort Ord, California. I had to train, uh, push recruits. and. You recall at that time, there was a draft going on. And every eligible 18-year-old had to register for the draft and then um, get into the military. Well, at Fort Ord, I was training for the infantry. Mm -hmm. So for two months, I, I had to train the recruits. And then later, went on to uh, school in Fort Knox, Kentucky, um, with armor training. Mm -hmm. But moving forward, I guess that kind of beginning and with a Jesuit training at the University of San Francisco, it kind of propelled me into my life's vision, as it turns out. Never satisfied with what I was doing. I always felt like there was room for change, and I wanted to be an agent of change. But at the same time, I realized that we have a structure, national structure. In my case, in my early years, it was the military. Mm -hmm. So I tried to serve in whatever capacity to benefit the people of the United States. And then for me, in, in a way, reflecting now and speaking with you, you know, being half Hawaiian and be, having seen what happened in Hawaii, you know, kind of put me in a position, well, how, how can you do that? You know, you saw that how the United States came and 
took over the monarchy and so forth. And that, that kind of weighed on me as, as I carried on my, my duties. And I was fortunate that my various assigned me, assignments put me in command position. So now I, I could exercise thought and vision rather than just um, present myself and beautifully do what I'm told. And I, I think over the past, and, and in my book, I try to point it out. The book is not about war per se. Mm -hmm. It's how I handled it as an individual, as a Hawaiian. Because we weren't just soldiers. We looked like the enemy mm -hmm. in many cases. I was even stopped at one of the gates because I just happened to uh, be out with my commanding uh, major and we were playing volleyball outside of the compound. When we came back, we, we had our, only our uh, T-shirts on. My commander was black. He said, I don't have my ID because we left it in the barracks. So it passed through. I was sitting next to him. They said, where's your ID, sir? I said, I forgot my ID. They wrote me up and gave me a ticket. And you know, I didn't understand it, but I had a ticket for not having my proper uniform on and not having an ID, not the black major. Fortunately, as you know, Hawaiians stick together. So I, I went and saw the Hawaiians that worked in the Provo Marshal's office. <laughs> I never, never had to answer the, the ticket. But what I'm getting at is the, the book tries to um, express how one man's um, conflict not only in the war zone, but also in himself. Mm -hmm. Because I also looked at the Vietnamese as another brown people, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, although my wife was Caucasian, I, I still had to express myself in ways that I felt was my duty and my responsibility. So throughout the book, I talk about these different incidences, um, not again about war, the ugliness of war, but how I, one individual, one Hawaiian, reacted and took care of it. It was that simple, as far as I'm concerned. But again, as I point out in the book, it almost hurt. I came back to Hawaii twice at uh, International Airport, and, and other soldiers came off the uh, airplane, and there were tourists all over. And you know, Hawaii had changed during the 60s. And as I walked, you know, I was looking for my wife and I saw her waiting. And no one else was waiting for me, you know. And, and no one said, welcome home here. I, I had just won the Bronze Star. I was up for the Legion of Merit. And previously, I had gotten an Army Commendation Award. And uh, I think I had pro provided uh, projects and to answer uh, supply shortages that I felt could have shortened the war. And uh, I, I, let me just explain this one incident. Um, our helicopters were out of ammunition, out of supplies. And the VCs were moving down from the north and taking over a lot of villages. And the complaint we had in transportation headquarters was that we didn't have the supplies. And so I just sat there because I was responsible for the uh, helicopter supplies. So I, I said, to the major, that, that black major, I, I think I have an answer. So he takes me to MACB where all the top colonels were there. Uh, the, the Army, Navy, Air Force, all bird colonels. And here's this black major and this brown captain. And we go in there and the major believed me, says, tell them your plan. So I told them what I wanted to do, but it would have to take concerted effort of all the major services because we got to transport the ammunition and other supplies from the Philippines into Vietnam. The Navy has to coordinate the landing. Army got to move it. They got to move it south. The Air Force got to fly it. It has to be a concerted effort. And I demonstrated how it would be done. And I waited. At the head of the table was a full bird Army colonel. So I waited, he looked at me, he says, Captain, how long have you been in the military? Proudly, I said, six years, sir. And he looked at me and he said, I've been in this man's army for 30 years, and I'm not about to give um, an approval on a plan that might work. 
<laughs> I handed in my resignation at that point. I just could not believe these bird colonels, all sixes, telling me we can't move forward on a plan that may work. Anyway, so just to ask you yeah. briefly. Yeah. Well, me, I, it, it, it's, it goes with the uh, no good deed goes unpunished. That's right. That's right. <laughs> that's right. So, you know, it, for me, the war, like I said, was complex as an individual. Um, and again, I try to reflect that in the book. And because of my position, both in 65 and 68, this was right uh, during the Tet Offensive, um, I was sent all over the place. I never knew where I was going. I just got the orders and I was gone. And I couldn't tell anybody where I was going because I didn't know. I just had to open up my orders and go. And many times, in most instances, I traveled alone armed with a 45 caliber pistol. Um, and that was it, you know, and I, I got on airplane. And I think at times I was able to board the aircraft, whatever, whatever it would be, a fixed wing or a helicopter, ahead of other officers, higher ranking officers, because they didn't know who I was. You know, they'd see my, the brass of my collar, they look at me, you know, this tall Hawaiian Filipino boy that looked like the enemy, and they couldn't, the Vietnamese soldiers salutes me. They, they didn't know what was happening because I, I was in my combat gear. And, uh, and so in a way, it helped me move around the country, but on the other hand, it, it really hurt, mm -hmm. you know? And like I said, when I finally uh, come home, there was no greeting, no band, no flag waving, just one woman sitting in her southern drawl, Ah, <laughs> <laughs> that that was my time in Vietnam. And that's more than a lot of us got. That's right. And that's uh, right. you were very lucky to have that. That's right. Uh, I, that must have been a heck of an experience, especially going back to Tennessee for you. Kentucky. Or Kentucky, pardon me. Uh, that Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, I mean, I <laughs> it's desegregation uh, was just occurring. That's right. In 64 and 65 with the Civil Rights Act and also right. with the, uh, the Voting Rights Act. It must have been a, a heck of a, an experience for you and an eye-opener. Oh, very much, you know. Again, I, I told you I was at Fort Ord and then we traveled uh, two, two other officers, one Caucasian and one Spanish man. Mm -hmm. And the first night we were in Louisville, the guy said, hey, let's go get a drink. Good idea, you know, it's been a long ride. So we go to the nearest bar in downtown Louisville, and it was a jumping place. We go, and we're in uniform, and we go in. A Caucasian guy goes in, nothing. The Spanish Mex Mexican guy goes in, nothing. I was stopped. And so, you know, they, they came to my aid to say, hey, what's happening in Hawaii? I said, I don't know. So I took out my ID, and I, have carried a state ID all these years. Mm -hmm. So I showed him my state ID. And he goes, oh, you're Hawaiian. Pass on, pass through. So I had a grand time. But again, to, to answer your query, yes, oh. it was difficult. So it made you, you, you must have had a subconscious thought, or, or at least that, that feeling while you were there. Well, yeah, constantly. And, and I did marry the girl I, I met there. Mm -hmm. uh, in Louisville. So, you know, and I, I was kind of taken aback because my wife then had said the, the wedding will be in Louisville. Mm. And uh, sure enough, oh. no problem. Well, I'll tell you what, but Gene. Psychologically, <laughs> it was there. We'll get back and talk some more with uh, Gene about his book and his experiences after these messages. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. Every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science, where we'll dig into science, dig into the meat of science, dig into the joy and delight of science. We'll discover why science is indeed fun, why science is interesting, why people should care about science, and care about the research that's being done out there. It's all great, it's all entertaining, it's all educational, so I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science. Hello, 
I'm Helen Dora Hyden, the host of Voice of the Veteran, seen here live every Thursday afternoon at 1 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. As a fellow veteran and veterans advocate with over 23 years experience serving veterans, active duty, and family members, I hope to educate everyone on benefits and accessibility services by inviting professionals in the field to appear on the show. In addition, I hope to plan on inviting guest veterans to talk about their concerns and possibly offer solutions. As we navigate and work together through issues, we can all benefit. Please join me every Thursday at 1 p.m. for the Voice of the Veteran. Aloha. Welcome back to It Never Got Quiet. We're speaking today with uh, Gene Tawana about his book, Almost a Hero. Gene, I have a question for you. One of my favorite writers was Robert Heinlein. One of his wittier quotes was, writing is not necessarily something that is to be ashamed of, but do it in private and wash your hands afterward. <laughs> I've only read the excerpt uh, on the uh, blog site, Almost a Hero, uh, on the Heroes 50 website. Your style is engaging, and I look forward to reading the rest of the book. So what is it that motivated you to write? Uh, is it your attempt at the great American novel, or is it uh, just something that you compelled to, that you needed to share? Well, you know, just as you say, you're going to write a book, a meaningful piece. You do do it in private. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, I think, in my case, the private moments were like 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. Mm. And I never had any inclination or desire to write a book. Somehow it came out of me. Mm -hmm. And once I started, I couldn't stop. And looking back when the manuscript finished, the first draft, I, I couldn't believe those words came out of me and those thoughts came out of me. How I remember, I'll never know. And um, I, I did a lot of research, obviously, when you're writing a book about the Vietnam War and so forth, and what was really happening everywhere at that time in the United States especially. But I, I, I never planned to write it. And you know, let, let me throw in one thing, if I may. The title of the book is called Almost a Hero. Um, a Vietnam, a soldier, uh, Vietnam journal. I, I picked that title, just, it came to me. And the reason for the title is that during the 60s, um, before the war really erupted, every eligible 18 year old had to sign up for the draft. Mm -hmm. So that meant once the war began, they, they could have been sent, or was already sent, to Vietnam. And I think the number was like half a million soldiers eventually gone. So in my mind, everybody that was signed up could have been a hero. And to me, anyone who was killed, wounded, or otherwise maimed were heroes. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, after two tours, I was unstrapped, and so therefore, I like many others could have been, we were almost a hero. And it, you know, I, I just felt so strongly because of my experiences there, and you never knew what would happen day after day, and uh, how you would survive. And you, di you didn't survive as far as I'm, you know, I, I learned with, with your mindset. You just did what, whatever was necessary. I remember one time we were attacked, a uh, rocket attack, and before the rocket hit the ground, I was off my bunk and running. And when I got down, the rocket started coming in. I just lie down, and there was a rain gutter, and I told myself, make you self level with the ground. <laughs> <laughs> That was my survivor mode as the rockets hit. And you know, I got up after that, you know, the mist, and <laughs> I'll go another day. But anyway, you know, like I said, it, it's an experience that you don't plan, you, you just react. Oh, but it must, it obviously had an impact on your life and how you think, and <clears throat> you say you weren't wounded, but uh, a lot of folks came back with PTSD, right, and right, uh, right. You know, our souls were wounded in a way, right. uh, especially with this Ken Burns documentary showing yes. so much that we didn't know. And, and I couldn't watch it. I started watching yeah. it, and I disagreed, because I just felt like it told us 
story in a broader sense, but I needed to get to the individual. Because each one of us, we're heroes, mm -hmm. potential heroes. And each one of us, no matter what branch of service, no matter what your uh, calling was in, in terms of duty, you reacted. So I, I felt that there was not enough of an individual input uh, I, that I stopped watching. I, I just said, I can't watch this anymore. But you're right. Um, until I wrote the book, I never thought of Vietnam. Um, I don't know why. Maybe it was inside I didn't want to talk about it. Maybe I was wounded more than I realized mm -hmm. emotionally. I don't know. But when I wrote the book, that's why I say, I, I don't know how I brought all of these images back. And uh, I talked to a couple of people who assisted me, and they too, and one fellow especially, he was with the 25th Infantry Division, and he, he was a lead platoon to bring the division into uh, Vietnam. And he, he had the same reaction. Um, he had a different mission than I did, but his reaction as an individual was essentially the same. So when we talked, I felt that we were on the same level. Mm -hmm. Never mind that my job was, you know, flying around the country or traveling around the country, carrying out orders, uh, whereas he had to defend positions, go out on individual missions. I didn't have to do that. Well, the thing about Vietnam is there was no front line, right. and nobody was safe from uh, a rocket or a mortar attack or even being sniped at. That's right. So uh, you know, I was relating to your story about the rockets coming in. Yeah. I always felt that my buttons were in the way for me getting any lower. So. Well, I'll tell you, for me, uh, my greatest fear was, would be, uh, excuse me, uh, sitting on the john when that rocket hit. I said, nobody will know where I was, you know, because I, I was there alone. <laughs> I'll, we'll we'll yeah, leave right. later. <laughs> uh, I had an experience like that. Oh, I see. And, uh, the, the shrapnel went through the side of the wall, so it was a, it was a good spot to be in. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> oh, heck. How do you feel about compulsory service? I mean, you dealt with the draftees at Fort Ord, and that was uh, one of the uh, basic training centers as well as uh, AIT. Right. And uh, you know you're dealing with these young That's kids right. coming in that are don't know anything about military life, no discipline, uh, right. straight off of uh, mama's apron strings, and you got to turn them into fighting men. That's right. Well, a direct answer is I'm all for it. I wish it were back in. Uh, one of my sons is a first sergeant in the Army Reserve here in Hawaii, uh, National Guard. Uh, it's 30 years in. Uh, not even 50 yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, he started in the Air Force Reserve. And I, I saw what it made of him, how it assisted him, and uh, I, I'm so proud of him. I, I have a grandchild now I'm going to Air Force uh, ROTC at Kaiser, and he looks great in his uniform. <laughs> and like I said in the beginning, and yet I have this tug and pull because I'm a native Hawaiian, and I'm thinking we're invaded also. Why would I want my people to go out there and defend? Because you have to. This is your life, you know? And uh, I think that learning experience that one of your science show begins here, mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it has to happen. Uh, I think this, these, um, those that didn't go because they had uh, deferment of some sort, you know, it's okay for them, but I think as, as a national rule, it should be compulsory. It's interesting. Uh, there have been a lot of people who have been calling for national compulsory service, not necessarily the military, but right. uh, Peace, Corps, Peace Corps or whatever. Right. Uh, or one of our future guests is a Peace Corps volunteer, and he'll be on the program. Okay. And we're gonna be talking about that in terms of the legacy of Vietnam and uh, what it meant to him versus the other two guests that are gonna be on the program who were veterans or who are veterans. And I think what we're, we're all looking at is since the end of the draft, we have seen a division in America. Right. And right. you're talking about uh, we were invaded uh, 
my forefathers were the invaders. <laughs> and, but it's, it's still, you're looking to work as a nation and as a group together. That's right. And that's what we did in the military. That's right. And uh, I think an awful lot of that uh, sectarianism or tribalism would go away if we all learned to work together. Yeah. You know, I just want to add one thing um, as part of this interview. This year, for the first time, and why it happened, I, I don't know, um, the 4th of July celebration, you know? And I, I sat there and watched all of to do, the rockets, red glare, and so forth. And I thought again to myself, well, as a native Hawaiian, that's the day that you should remember that the Marnegate was overthrown, mm -hmm. you know? So for the first time, I, I had this, again, tug and pull. Why, I don't know, maybe because I'm a little older and I've seen a lot of things happening, just as you have. And I think we have to share that knowledge, share that experience with those behind us so that they can see history as a learning episode. Exactly. Yeah. You know, ra rather than something that happened. Mm -hmm. It's happening every single day. Anyway, thank you for the question. <laughs> and, we're, and we're all part of that history. That's we right. still have a part to play. That's right. And uh, I appreciate the fact that uh, you were a psychology major. <laughs> and, and maybe that had to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, heck. No, I, I, I really appreciate you coming on here. And uh, you know, I, I really hope that your, your book turns out well. Oh, and, me uh, too. <laughs> I hope it turns into a television program. Well, you know, I, I think we all have those aspirations yeah, right. when you become a writer and think, ah, I'm going to be on the New York Times bestseller yeah. list. But uh, somehow or other, uh, it takes a bit to get there. Right. So, whatever. Gene, thanks for being on the program. My pleasure. Yeah. My pleasure. And uh, again, good luck. We'd like to have some feedback. If you have some comments, please send us an email at 808vietnamvets at gmail.com. I would like to thank the staff here at Think Tech Hawaii and for all their support and assistance. Truly, without them, this program would not be possible. Please come back again next week for another issue of It Never Got Quiet.